Hello, everyone. If you are just joining us, welcome to the Radical Exchange Annual Conference. Our next session will be the Nobody Movement inside Taiwan's digital democracy. I'd like to welcome Avital Balwit to the virtual stage to begin our session. Hello um, and welcome again. I'm really glad to see so many people here, even if it's just virtually. My name is Avital Bowit and I work with Radical Exchange um, and I helped organize this conference. So I'm really hoping you guys are enjoying it. Um, I have the wonderful honor of getting to introduce um, our next speaker. And um, after she talks, there'll be an opportunity for questions. So if you're watching this through Brella, you can enter your questions right there. And you can also upvote the questions of others um, so that she answers the most popular questions at the end. So now a little bit more about our speaker. Mei Chen Li is an anthropologist who studies digital activism and network politics. She is an active participant of GovZero, a Taiwan-based civic tech community, and has served in the program committee of the GovZero Summit 2018. She holds an MPhil in social anthropology from the University of Cambridge and is finishing up her PhD degree at UC Davis. She is also the co-author of the Taiwan Open Government Report 2014 to 2016, and she is a former writer of GovZero News. So now I will turn over the stage to Mei-Chan. Great, thank you so much for the introduction and thank you everyone for being here with me. Um, so first of all, sure, let me share my screen. Okay. Do you all see my slides here? Okay, great. Okay, that is all. Great, okay, so today uh, I'm going to share with you my research so it's about a, a hacker community based in Taiwan, whose name is GovZero, and their experiments on digital democracy. Uh, you might hear this name from Audrey Tom in her other talks. Uh, she is one of our keynote speaker in the morning, and she has been participating in GovZero before she became uh, the minister of Taiwan, uh, the digital minister of Taiwan. So in the keynote, she shared a lot of exciting social innovations uh, in Taiwan, and some of them are actually in collaboration with GovZero. So let me get started. Um, ever since the invention of the internet, there have been discussions about how the internet can be used to boost participation, to deepen democracy, and to bring more freedom and equality to our societies. On the one hand, uh, we see revolutions spark on and through social media. The internet seems to be capable of mobilizing a huge unorganized cloud quicker than ever before, like what we uh, observed from uh, the Arab Spring or uh, Occupy Wall Street. Uh, however, on the other hand, critics warn us about selectivism. That is that the internet only provides mental comfort for people to continue hiding behind computers and clicking likes and shares as if they really contribute something. So observing all these phenomena, uh, I came to a question. Can digital technologies facilitate uh, persistent participation and produce scalable impact? And this is the question that leads me to GovZero. So uh, GovZero is a, a civic hacker community based in Taiwan. Uh, it was founded in December 2012 from Hackson and soon became a huge community with thousands of participants. The name GovZero requests a letter O in government with a number zero to indicate uh, the computer binary zero and one. This name signifies both their netizen identity and the grassroots bottom-up approach of activism. So uh, GovZero stands at the intersection of three fields. Uh, first, free and open source software, second, uh, social activism, and third, uh, civic media. In general, uh, GovZero built civic technologies to promote government transparency and experiment on various ways uh, for public participation. But their topics are not confined to government and politics. Their projects cover uh, a very wide uh, range of social domains, from food justice to cultural uh, preservation, um, land uh, justice, uh, agriculture, and so on. So, uh, I think GovZero is a very good example that shows us how persistent digital participation is possible. Over the past year, uh, eight years, 
Gopsura has grown steadily. The community has no membership and there are multiple channels to get involved. So in the number here, uh, these numbers give you a picture of how many people participate uh, in this community. To get involved, uh, one can contribute codes uh, to its GitHub or to volunteer in a hackathon or to write share notes, documents, or to engage in conversation on its Slack channel. So uh, GovSwift is not a one-time quiz, and the community keeps attracting new participants. So every, uh, it holds uh, by monthly hackathons uh, from uh, the very beginning and until now, even during the pandemic, uh, they managed to move the hackathons online. And still like every hackathon, we still have a lot of new participants, roughly between like 20% to 40%, depending on if there's like big social events happening in Taiwan at the moment when the hackathon is held. Uh, and it also uh, explore different social domains. Recently, education has become one of the key focus. Um, GovSu also has real impacts on Taiwan's politics and society. For example, GovSu played an important role uh, in the 2014 Sunflower Movement. So the Sunflower Movement is one of the most influential social movement in Taiwan's recent history. Protesters occupy the legislative realm Legislative event is uh, equivalent to the parliament here in the United States. So it's a big thing, right? Uh, the parliament guy, uh, got occupied. So protesters occupy the legislative event for 24 days to protest a free trade pact between Taiwan and China and demanded more openness and transparency of the government operations and uh, the process of registration. Uh, although Gupta was not the leading role in the movement, they help set up speedy internet that connect protesters inside and outside the parliament, uh, the, the legislative union. And they also build transparency and collaboration tools to facilitate the movement. Uh, for example, on the slide, uh, is a screenshot of the uh, hack folder. Uh, hack folder is uh, a tool developed by GovZero. Uh, it is used to organize different URLs under one site so that different web pages such as uh, live streaming of the Occupy site, uh, spreadsheet of resources or like activities, uh, news reports can be organized uh, and shared online under the same uh, hack folder. So during the Sunfell movement, protesters use this hack folder to organize all sorts of resources and activities to make it a really uh, uh, digital ways, uh, a digital mobilized uh, movement. So, and sorry, another example is Audrey Tom, so Taiwan's digital minister. Audrey was and still is an active participant of GovZero. Before joining the government, uh, she was known for her contributions to V Taiwan, a GovZero project of digital deliberation. Uh, I will go into the more details about V Taiwan later. So when she was appointed as the minister, there were even some people joking about it was the Gabzura community being appointed. However, other Gabzura disputed this idea, emphasizing that Audrey did not represent Gabzura, since no one can represent Gabzura. And Gabzura would continue to supervise the government as well as this new minister. Uh, anyway, Gabzura assures that uh, persistent participation and scalable impacts can happen together, but how? So let me start slow from how everything began. Uh, this is a little bit background. Uh, and, and Taiwanese uh, sociologist Lin Zhonghong started the social political transformations in Taiwan. Uh, and he proposed that people who are born between 1978 and 1990, who are now around age 20 to 40, are the lost generation. So this table gives you a sense of what they are experiencing. In general, this age group grew up in Taiwan's economic boom. They enjoyed political freedom as the legacy of the democratization movements in the 80s and 90s. And finally, when they graduate from college, Taiwan's economy enters a time of stagnation. So houses are unaffordable and low salaries force many to work extra hours to sustain a basic uh, standard of living. 
class disparity and income inequality leads to social conflict. Um, yet this is also a time of social unrest. Uh, here are a number of uh, various social movements pushing for all kinds of reforms uh, for equality and justice uh, after the turn of the century. Um, this include uh, same-sex marriage. By the way, uh, Taiwan uh, had legalized same-sex marriage. I think it's the first one in Asia uh, last year. And also include anti-nuclear power plants, labor justice, anti-media monopoly. So all this uh, social movement just happening in the past uh, two decades. Uh, so this, this, those generation uh, are also a generation who are willing to challenge status quo, to take to the street and to seek changes. So I would say the lost generation is actually a civic generation. They move from anger to action. Gobsur emerged among many other activist groups in 2012. So what is Gobsur? Uh, this is perhaps the most difficult questions uh, in my dissertation because Gobsur refuses to be defined easily as any conventional organization. And also because there is no authorities in Gobsur, so interpretations are uh, left uh, to every participant. Uh, there are a number of ways to describe Gobsur. So people will say it is a leaderless, borderless, polycentric, self-organized, uh, open source or uh, grassroots uh, network. Um, and different Gobsur uh, might see it differently. Uh, I especially like a grassland analogy by a participant. So let me read uh, what he wrote. So he said, Gobsur is a piece of fenceless grassland. In the middle of the grassland is a billboard of the Gobsur Manifesto. Everyone agreeing with the manifesto can work in freely and work out any time. How do the people on the grassland interact with each other? They do it like Japanese view Charlie Blossom. Simply find a space, put on a pic picnic mat, and start to chat with each other. In Gobsur, you can initiate a project at your own will and put on a mat to invite others to join. There are quite a few Gobsurers enjoying sitting alone and preparing their own delicacies. As they open their mailboxes, the smile will spontaneously attract other Gobsurers. On the grasslands, no one gives command. People come and go. You might find some familiar faces who stay here longer than others and listen to the stories uh, that happen on the grassland, but you will never find a representative. So this grassland uh, analogy offers a vivid pictures to describe the atmosphere of Gobsur. It is free and open, joyful and tasty. Uh, about the food, uh, I will also talk about that later because it's a very important element uh, in the community building uh, in Gobsur. So everyone here share the same uh, beautiful views and they together create this communal space. So Gabzero uh, is founded on a nobody philosophy. Uh, if you ever participate in any of uh, Gabzero's activities, you will hear they say this again and again. Don't ask why nobody is doing this. You are the nobody. We are one with some in Chinese. So you can see I actually wearing a, a nobody t-shirt here. And this is uh, from uh, 2018, the Gabzhou Summit. Uh, so all volunteer has this t-shirt. Uh, here we can see that nobody uh, is a call for action and a becoming of actor. The nobody figure is very interesting here. Uh, nobody is not somebody and nobody can be anybody. So nobody is inclusive and anti-hierarchical. Nobody is not defined by ideology, social class, or political stance. Nobody is first and foremost a being of action. Like this comic uh, portrays, being a nobody is to act. Nobody disputes the assumption that politics is politician's game and encourages everyone's uh, participation. 
Nobody is able to connect in a distributed network. The actions are spontaneous and each action creates new connection. Uh, however, there's no need to have mutual consent before an action is taken. Instead, action is where consent forms and uh, dissent reveals. Nobody uh, is diverse and inclusive. Uh, here on the screen, you see uh, are the uh, skill stickers used uh, in the Azure Hexons. So Hexon participants will pick up whatever skill they have and put these stickers on their pages. So these stickers uh, include different coding language, but also other domain knowledge, uh, including law, writing, photography, design, among many other things. And these stickers shows that participants are not identified by social class or status, but by their uh, skills and expertise. And this diverse skill and uh, uh, expertise are the foundation to collaborate. So, uh, so far, you might wonder, like, the image of nobody sounds very idealistic, right? But how uh, do they organize themselves in reality? Uh, my argument is that uh, in GAP0, organization does not come before action. The right action, uh, sorry, the right question to ask is perhaps how do they take action? And it is from action that GAPS as a nobody movement emerged. So everything starts from hacking. GAPS are mobilized around its bi monthly hackathons. This hackathon is not a competition. There is no rewards, and they do not aim for producing any profitable words. In uh, this one day event, GAPS come together to pitch, brainstorm, and build solutions for all kinds of social issues. Uh, this event is self-organized. Participants arrange their own agenda on a shared spreadsheet, uh, like the one I show on the screen. So you can put in your title, your slides, um, what license you use, uh, and then on that day, like uh, the host will just like introduce one by one. And this spreadsheet will be open to everyone to fill in before the event. Um, Lots of food and free spaces are also provided for social connection. So the agenda here show you that what happens during the hackathon during the day. So there will be like uh, roughly two spaces. One space is uh, for hacking. So there will be uh, good electricity, Wi-Fi, uh, a lot of tables, uh, whiteboards, et cetera. Uh, another place will be a food area where you will have plenty of foods like from brunch, lunch, tea time, less meal after meals, and that people just getting around food, chat with, uh, with each other, brainstorm new ideas and new projects. So I call the Hexon a rite of passage for GAP servers because it's where the idea of nobody is confirmed, celebrated and embodied through this like food sharing, uh, the space, the uh, this body experiences of typing while at the same time talking with your teammates. Right? So in the hackathons, uh, Gobsuros produce a wide variety of projects. This is the banner of the fifth anniversary hackathon. Uh, each billboard represents a Gobsuros project, and these are just a sampling of them. Um, as you can see here, uh, the topics include uh, democracy, government, but also uh, environment, misinformation, agriculture, and more. Uh, I have a few examples of GAPSU project that I want to share with you. Um, the first is campaign finance digitization. So campaign finance digitization uh, is an early project started in 2014 uh, after the Sangha movement. We aim to open up campaign finance report of political candidates. So uh, because uh, the, one of the sovereign movement's demand is the openness and transparency of the government. And then after movement, there was uh, a local election happening in the end of the year. So like a lot of activists and governors just uh, shift their focus to this project, wanting to push more transparency in the government. Before this project, uh, 
political candidates ha uh, have to uh, had to report their campaign finance report to the government, but these reports were locked in a government building, and people had to visit office uh, and pay fees in order to bring out the print copies. Uh, yet uh, the process, uh, as you can imagine, uh, was a hustle, and the reports were not really accessible for the general public. So it made analysis of the data very difficult. So since campaign finance is important information to understand the exchange between politicians and corporations, GovZero initiated this project. So what I do is build a cloud sourcing website uh, to collaborate on digitizing this report. Uh, and the, um, there uh, were a group of volunteers just uh, went to the office and pay those fees and uh, print out those copies, upload, it, uh, upload them onto a cloud. And then uh, this report uh, were uh, breaking down into small pieces. And then uh, the website adopted the method of CAPTCHA uh, to decipher those small pieces. So CAPTCHA, uh, I think everyone is very familiar with it, even though you might not know its name is CAPTCHA. So it's a computer test to determine an online user uh, is a human being or not, by ask the user to decipher distorted images of numbers and letters that the computer cannot read. So using this method, uh, GovZero, uh, GovZero helps to like break down this uh, huge amount of uh, reports with watermarks and uh, cloud sourcing the task of digitization to the online anonymous uh, users. So the result was quite amazing. Within 24 hours, over 10,000 people completed uh, 300,000 data entries. And also with a push from the civil society, the government started to amend uh, the political uh, donation acts in, in 2014. Uh, however, the draft was put on waiting for legislative approval for another four years. A new act was finally implemented in June 2018 that requires all campaign finance reports to be published online. So uh, next example is COFAX, stands for Collaborative Fax. Uh, COFAX is a fact-checking chatbot on the Messenger app Line. So Line uh, is similar to WhatsApp. It is the biggest message app in Taiwan. Like the United States, um, Taiwan suffered greatly from misinformation and disinformation. According to a research by the VDEM project, Taiwan suffered the most from foreign online disinformation campaigns among 202 countries in 2018. The close environment of, uh, the close environment of chat room worsened the situation because it's hard uh, to verify message inside chat rooms and people from outside do not know what rumors are circulating there. So children become the perfect filter bubble in that sense. Also, uh, professional check, uh, fact checker uh, are not quick enough to respond as the number of misinformation is enormous. Um, so what COFES does is to connect a cloud sourced uh, fact checking database with line users through a chatbot. COFES users can forward suspicious message to the chatbot uh, in line app. Uh, the chatbot will search its database and reply to the user with all available fact checking responses in the database. And that database uh, is cloud sourced. It runs like a, a Wikipedia. So all responses are written by volunteer editors. Everyone can become a, an editor. Uh, what you need is only to create an account on COFES website in order to start providing fact checking responses. And COFES did not review uh, these editors. Um, they actually do not, do not ask these editors to become professional fact checkers like what those like journalist style ways to, you know, to interview the person in the messages or like to really find the truth. Uh, what editor does is uh, to Google for more information, to read 
different information to discern uh, what is more reliable and provide all kinds of information to back to online use users so that uh, in lines they are not simply like one direction of uh, information. There will be like multiple messages for users to, to choose to read, to think. So Coface has been very, very successful. As for June 4th uh, this year, it has over 80,000 users. And uh, together they forward uh, more than 500,000 messages to the chatbot. Uh, the database is open to everyone. So uh, researchers uh, can uh, use this database to study what kind of rumors uh, are circulating in lines and, and how are they uh, fact checked. And every forwarding message has a unique URL. So in Taiwan, when you Google a suspicious message, uh, uh, COFES is open on the top uh, of the research, uh, search results. So that it's not only used for uh, chatbot users, but also for uh, general online users. COFES is not simply a chatbot and a database. It also uh, cultivates its editor community by holding meetup regularly. Uh, even professional fact checkers come to compose responses in COFES database. So COFES has a uh, bi-monthly meetup, but they also join Gapsu's bi-monthly hackathon, which means that every month uh, in somewhere in a physical space, you can find COFES team, you can join them, you can know how they work, uh, and you can also uh, participate in uh, fact checking. Okay. Um, the last uh, example I have here is V Taiwan. Uh, I think perhaps it is the most famous one outside of Taiwan. Uh, v Taiwan is a de deliberation platform. Uh, it is a sophisticated process combined with online tours and offline meetings to uh, deliberate on cyber related laws. Uh, v Taiwan is a collaboration between the government and GovZero from the very beginning. So at first, uh, it was uh, a minister with a portfolio before Audrey. So that minister, she came to uh, Jacqueline Tsai, she came to Gapsuro Hexon, proposed an idea about building this platform. And then Audrey, when she was not yet a minister, uh, joined the group with other hackers and they together come up with uh, this uh, platform and process. So the process is that, uh, like this. Um, the government department will propose topics that are controversial and difficult to reach agreements, such as Uber, UberX, um, to the Taiwan process. Then uh, a government sponsor, NGO, uh, help uh, organize all the materials into easy digestible slides and documents. And then the V Taiwan Tax Force uh, facilitates conversations with all kind of online tours and offline meetings. So one of the most uh, famous tours uh, is POLIS. Uh, POLIS is a new way of uh, online survey that instead of give, uh, giving us numbers, it helps different opinion groups and find mutual agreement across group. So on the screen is uh, an example. So the way it works is that uh, uh, you will see a statement and you can vote agree, not agree or neutral. And uh, at, in the beginning, there might be a couple of statements uh, preceded by uh, the government or the, the facilitator team. And as you read each statement and you vote, you will see the avantages move between each other and like uh, those from a group might be sharing the same opinion, those in another group might be in oppositional uh, opinions. And then after reading all those statements, uh, you can add your own new comments. And, then, and the idea is that when you read everything, you will try to compose a statement that can win more agreement uh, so that that new uh, statement can become some kind of uh, foundation of consensus, right? Because people always want to, to make others agree with you. 
so that the idea will become less and less radical and more and more workable from the government side and from the civil society side. Um, I think a uh, police founder, Colin McGill, is also a speaker of the conference and sh uh, he will speak tomorrow. So if you are interested in that, uh, you probably want to check out his talk. Uh, but I also want to emphasize that V Taiwan is not simply an online platform. Uh, after gathering opinions by all these online tours, V Taiwan will hold stakeholder meetings to encourage conversations between different parties. Um, these meetings use deliberation techniques to have focused conversations, and they are always live broadcasted. All the notes and documents uh, will also be published online. So, uh, so far, uh, VTAMA has dealt with 27 rulemaking proposals, uh, including some controversial ones like UberX and online liquor sale. Uh, not every rulemaking proposals uh, become the final uh, law, the le final legislation, uh, uh, but it, they do uh, provide very important uh, references for legislators to uh, make the laws. Uh, unfortunately, V Taiwan was not so impactful as it was before 2016, as the number of proposals from the government has decreased significantly. But the V Taiwan Task Force still have wicked makeup and try to engage in cyber related policies, even though the government side has uh, almost withdrawn from the process. Um, however, V Taiwan I think is still very significant as exemplified how digital democracy might look like in a national legislative level. So from the above examples, uh, we see that GovZero not only provides tools to people, but also invite them to join making the tools. Uh, through the invitation, they transform bystanders into active uh, citizens. There are a few techniques used by observers when they cultivate the craft of uh, digital uh, participation. The first uh, technique is cloud sourcing. So in, in observer, cloud sourcing uh, is also called fen shen fa shu, which literally means chopping firewood with clones. Uh, fen shen is kind of like mysterious supernatural skill of cloning oneself. Um, in observer, fen shen is not supernatural, it is supported by all kinds of technologies. And through uh, cloud sourcing, uh, even participants contribute only a small part of their time and effort. Together, they can achieve a huge goal. Then the second technique uh, is the usage of open technologies, which include open data, transparency tools, like live, uh, live streaming or shared nodes, and collaborative tools uh, like HackFolder or HackMD. Uh, open technologies allow participation across time and space. Um, then uh, human and farm are another technique that promotes participation. Though anger is where Gabzo started, humor turns the anger into positive motivations and produce collective actions. So in Gabzo, people not only make fun of politics, they put a lot of efforts to make politics fun, so as to encourage more participation. So, but we should uh, also keep in mind that humor uh, is always cultural and fun, require, fun requires sensible designs. Uh, when Gobsero designs civic technologies, they are, are not simply making tools, but they actually engage in a translation process that turns political and social issues into codes and interfaces. Um, then time is also another key. So being timing and sensitive to local issues allow Gabzero to maintain relevance and keep hacking in high spirit. The fast response to the Sunflower movement is one example. Uh, another example are uh, a, a face mask map and coronavirus checking map during the pandemic. Right? Um, the last, I think, it's also the most important uh, technique or things is build a community. So Gabzo shows us that even in this digital age, face-to-face in-person interaction is still important in connecting people together. 
in gap zero, food is essentially, uh, sorry, food is especially essential for social networking and community building. Gap zero is so proud of the food they prepare for each exome. The food team is always devoted to feeding up all participants and giving everyone an unforgettable test of food. Uh, food links them uh, in a shared body experience and provide icebreaker to start a conversation and produce a sense of community. So uh, this is my last slide. Uh, let me return to my uh, the main topic. So can digital uh, technologies deepen democracy? My argument is that the internet does not promise decentralization, participation, and democracy. What we can learn from Gap Zero is that to make digital democracy work, we need good designs and sensible translation on the one hand, and we also need online and offline collaboration on the other hand. Oh, sorry, this is the real last slide. So Gap Zero is having a summit at the end of the year. Uh, it's now calling for proposals. Uh, the, uh, the summit will be held uh, in Tainan. It's a very beautiful city, a thousand part of city with a lot of Taiwan's culture and historical uh, views uh, and it's famous for its food. So if you want to know Gobzero, want to have a test of Gobzero, like come to join us, of course, if the travel permits. Okay, thank you everyone. Awesome, thank you so much, Mei Chen, um, for that really interesting talk. That was perfect timing too, because for those of us who were here this morning, um, I heard Audrey Tang talk a little bit about Gov Zero, but I still had a lot of questions um, and you provided really important context and history. Um, but thankfully for this Q&A, I still have some questions. Um, and so we're gonna spend about the next 13 minutes on questions. And I'm gonna start with one of my own um, and then I'll switch to some audience questions. So for anyone in the audience that still has a question, you can still submit it um, and I'll see it and I'll hopefully get to it in that time. So um, my first question is something that I know your research focuses on, but you didn't get a chance to talk as much about um, during this talk, which is about the relationship between Gov Zero and the Taiwanese government. Because it seems like there's been periods of time where um, that relationship has been very positive and collaborative, and also periods of time, like you mentioned, with them sort of moving away from Be Taiwan, um, that they aren't as supportive of Gov Zero anymore. Um, so, what has the relationship been like with the government, and kind of how has it changed over time? Great, right. thank you for the question. So, yeah, I think this probably is the most uh, important questions for us to think about uh, since we want it really work and we want really, you know, it's in reality, right? And uh, the simple question to that is Gap Zero doesn't take any political positions as a whole. So it's actually uh, makes no sense to say uh, if Gap Zero is more resistant, uh, resistant to the government or more cooperative. But this is like, too simple to answer. Uh, if we observe uh, the participants, we'll find uh, the chance like more and more collaborations happening between government participants and uh, the government. And that is because uh, um, this see from how it starts when 2012 it started, it's more about like a small group of people quitting in the government want to push more transparency, right? And the government did not really, um, did not even know about Gap Zero. So it's the turning point is like 2014 when the South Farm movement break out and then the government and a lot of uh, the general public noticed Gap Zero. And it's also a time that uh, you can see a transformation about the government that want to reach the younger generations. They want to do better communications. So at that time, it was a, a KMT party for people who probably not uh, know Taiwan politics that well. So Taiwan have like main, two main parties, uh, we call Bu KMT party or Gwing uh, DPP parties. And uh, the KMT party used to be an authoritarian regime which uh, a, a lot of Gap Zero project want to challenge. So it was uh, 
in KMT's regime, uh, in KMT's ruling that the Sangfa movement happened. And after movement, the KMT party actually want to reach the younger generation, but uh, it's hard for them to reach the activist group. Since the activist group, you know, they, they have the really, they really just hate the government at all. However, it's easier to uh, reach Gabzuo since he adopts an open principle. So they are more willing to seek changes from within. Uh, by they, I mean some of Gabzuo because it does not represent everyone in this uh, huge, uh, diverse community. But uh, in 2014, so we, we see this kind of transformation starting. Uh, and then in uh, 2016, the DPP government uh, kind of like a kick out the KMT out of the, uh, the office. And that, uh, I think, marked a, a, a time that uh, more and more collaboration is happening, especially when OJ also became uh, the minister. However, uh, another way to think about this is that over the time, Gabzu community became more and more diverse. So uh, at first, there might not be any government officials participate in Gabzu. But then uh, after uh, 2014, uh, some uh, government officials uh, join Gabzu activities or some uh, Gabzu participants enter the government. And now it's hard to draw the line between the government and the Gabzu, right? And, and uh, or we, we, we can also say that the Gabzu don't want to draw the line because of this like open principle they adopt, right? But they will insist that because Gabzu uh, is a diverse community, there was ne never just a single voice. So there is still a lot of like uh, critics or resisting voices inside the community whenever the government, no matter is uh, DPP or KMT1 has some stupid ideas or bad policies, you can still feel that uh, resisting, uh, the, the energy of resisting uh, in, inside the, uh, the community. So I guess th this kind of gives a sense about how their the relationship with the, the government. Yeah. Thank you, that was super helpful. Um, and I guess our first audience question is from Madeline. And she is curious whether you think that the GovZero model can be scaled to other democracies, and if so, how? She is particularly thinking about her Australian context, and she's hoping that they could have something like that. And I just want to add, do you also know if it's happened anywhere else? Like, is there any other um, civic tech project you've heard of that sounds similar? Right, thank you. Yes, of course. I think um, definitely, like, Taiwan has its uniqueness. And like everywhere has its uniqueness, but it doesn't mean that uh, uh, we as human beings cannot learn from each other, right? So just give uh, everyone a uh, kind of examples. So in terms of civic tech uh, in the United States, as far as my knowledge goes, uh, I know there are Code for America, and then there is a Code for All network that emerged from Code for America. And they focus more on civic technologies and they are kind of more like uh, trying to provide good uh, digital services to improve public service, sorry, digital tools to improve public services. So they are not more, they are not like activists in that sense, but they do have uh, some elements of Gobsuro. Uh, and then we have pirate party in Europe, right? More like starting from uh, resisting more uh, protest uh, atmosphere and then uh, uh, cultivate the idea of uh, direct democracy and then form a party and then really get into the office. Right. And then we have uh, free and open source communities who try to practice the idea of uh, openness in their own community buildings, try to uh, build a structuralist uh, network. Right. So think about Gopzu as these things of combination of Kofa Mecca, civil tech, pirate parties, concept of democracy and also fast movements, structuralist organization and how these things move together in Gapsuro. And then also think about the example I just read is actually not, not of this from Taiwan. So can we really, you know, just like trying to combine ideas together 
and try to adjust them to the local uh, political context. So I think it's, it's definitely possible. Yeah. I like that optimistic viewpoint. I definitely hope that my own country, the US can learn a little something um, and I'm hopeful that it's, it's applicable to many contexts. The next question is from an anonymous asker and they uh, quote something you said in your talk. They said that um, you said action is where consent forms. Can you say more about this? Consent, consent in what sense and to what end? Um, so if I say that, I think, uh, I mean that, uh, so Gopso is like a group of activists and hackers. And uh, what it, uh, they always like this. Uh, so there is a big political controversy that happens. And then I really want to do something. But because of this nobody philosophy, I will not ask anyone to do something first. I will just jump in, uh, pitch some idea, throw out some code, make some project. And then if you agree with me, if you think this is an awesome idea, or if you also want to solve the problem, come join me, come to revise my code, come we together brainstorm something better. So this is how this conversation begin. But everything needs to start from someone, somebody. So uh, in Gapzero, I think they are more like truly hacker. They're, they're not like, oh, okay, uh, that's, uh, we have this issue. Okay, let's have a meeting or let's talk about it and let's make things very complicated, draw a very complicated structures and then no one did do anything, right? So this is how a lot of things felt because of the complexity of social issues. What I uh, uh, think of Gapzero is uh, provides some uh, interesting is they are not afraid of throwing out stupid things. They know uh, technology can be naive, can be problematic, but they don't want to stop from doing good things. So what I do is propose an idea and uh, ask everyone to collaborate. Then this open technology become very important in this process because by making it open, if uh, the project is really naive, they produce other problems, others will come to join and, and point it out, or they can just you know, push their own codes since it's open license, right? So I, I guess these are everything just together, this how consent forms. But also as, uh, as a project develop, there are also dissents. There are also like people just disagreeing with each other's approach. And sometimes it's like just um, impossible to have an agreement. And then um, uh, folk becomes a way to solve this conflict. Uh, although we know conflict still exists between these two projects. Uh, but I don't think uh, in any way Sculptural try to form any agreements so that they're always talking about rough consensus, rough consensus. And this idea is actually from the false movement. So this rough consensus, how they think uh, an important foundation of action. Awesome. We have time for one more question because we're at our last two minutes. Um, and our next question is also from an anonymous asker. And this is perfect because you currently go to school in the United States, so you'll probably be able to speak to this. And it's about the role of humor um, in Taiwan and in the US. And um, humor seems like it's really powerful in time, Taiwan. It seems like memes can be used to do a lot of education and to get people excited and involved in the civic tech and in government. Um, do you think that would work equally well in the US or is it too polarized of an environment for humor to play that role? Um, I don't want to like be so pessimistic the saying that it, um, it's impossible. Uh, Taiwan is also paralyzed in a sense that uh, there is a pro-China party and more pro-independence party, or like you can see this kind of uh, debate in Taiwan. Uh, but I think uh, in Taiwan, uh, human can most of the time produce more positive uh, result because of the strong civil society. So I guess uh, uh, how we, you know, like in civil society, there are different parties, different groups, and we can critique each other, we can hold different views, but we share the same value. 
Uh, and in Taiwan, I believe the same value is democracy. As we are very new with, with our democracy, we just, uh, our martial law was lifted in 1987. So our democracy is like less than 50 years. So we really treasure that. We really think that democracy is so important uh, that we can speak our ideas, that we can vote, and that democracy depends on conversation between each other, right? And my feeling about uh, the problem in American society is that sometimes freedom is way more important than other things. And then freedom can be used to in some crazy ways. Yeah. So the freedom to mean sometimes becomes the freedom to troll. But in Taiwan, like, uh, yes, they are trollers, but the power for civil society will automatically, like, they, those voices become less uh, relevant uh, in our conversation on the big issues. Yeah, so I think it's about values and about those foundation and how we reshape these values. Thank you. I'm glad to hear that. It's a really positive vision. Um, I just want to thank you so much for your time. It was wonderful talking with you today, and I hope you have a great day. Thank, thank you, everyone, for listening. Thank you.